Welcome back to Violating Community guidelines. guidelines with Brittany and Sarah. We're back, guys. We are. And we're front, too. <laughs> <laughs> so. I'll show you a back and a front. Yes. We, um, well, I guess there's actually no gap in recording because this comes out every Monday. Yeah. I was going to say, we're back. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, you guys listen to this every Monday. So yes. but the real fans do, you mm. betchas. It's like how, um, you know, like back in the day, they put like commercials in between. So like, but if you watch it just like on like a streaming service, there's just like that weird gap yeah. where the commercial would have gone, but they like fade to black and it's like, you'll never know the killer. The killer is yeah. dark. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> next week. Yeah. It is next week. <laughs> All right, guys, what are we talking about today? We're talking about true crime. Which, of course, as per usual, we have some disclaimers. Mm-hmm. Uh, first of all, being both of us are sensitive to light today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we're we're looking super sick and cool, wearing sunglasses inside, mm-hmm. and uh, they fixed the AC in this room, so you guys don't have to look at us sweating through our little skinny t-shirts anymore. Exactly, yeah. All right. Um, there is a serious disclaimer, though, because obviously when we're talking about true crime, there are a lot of variables at play. There's a lot of controversy al- around the popularization of mm-hmm. true crime online and whether or not it should be you know, a part of pop-, pop culture the way that it is. So it's a sensitive topic, given that the more recent the tragedy, the more painful it is for the victim's families, obviously, especially mm-hmm. when it's an ongoing investigation. Yeah. So we in no way are attempting to sensationalize or make jokes of these situations at all. We're more aiming to discuss and we're interested in why true crime intrigues us as human beings and internet users specifically. Because the internet has really helped this become a widespread phenomenon of like consistently the most listened to podcasts are comedy and true crime. Yeah. Which is like, why? What is it about wanting to drive to work and listen to how someone was violently murdered? Yeah. And it's crazy that it's also like a hybrid now. Like a lot of the top yeah. comedy podcasts are about murder. Which is scary in itself. I know. Well, not scary, but um, definitely a point of intrigue, yeah. I would say. Yes. So we want to get that out of the way because we know um, the internet warriors, the keyboard warriors will, that'll be the first comment if we mm-hmm. don't address it. And we obviously agree. You know, this is, we're coming at this from an angle of analysis and interest as as to why this has happened not so much that it's happened yeah so mm-hmm. just get that out of the way for you bitches i also feel like this is a little bit self-explanatory there's just there's gonna be a mention of murder and suicide so yeah. if those are sensitive topics for you maybe skip on this one guys yeah or skip to the end when we do the ad reads exactly <laughs> <laughs> maybe don't be as loyal this time yeah but we're going to start talking about true crime, a little bit about it. Do you want to take it away or should I? I'll take it away, Cuzzo. All right. Actually, you take it away, Cuzzo. All right. <laughs> true Crime is a nonfiction literary podcast and film genre in which the author examines an actual crime and details the actions of real people associated with and affected by criminal events. The crimes most commonly include murder, about 40% focus on tales of serial killers. I mean, I I couldn't imagine a podcast doing well when it talks about, like, famous tax evasions. Sure. Actually, Even though white-collar crime is interesting. Yeah, well, now that I said that out loud, I'm like, I, I would love to, like, hear about, like, Enron and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, next week. <laughs> <laughs> our white collar crime podcast comes out yes. it is interesting to um how rich people play by a different set of rules in, in life yeah i think that's very interesting so yeah it is really crazy and so continuing on true crime comes in uh, many forms such as books films podcasts and television shows <laughs> Thanks, oh, yeah, Stanley. i love that it's also in the newspaper sometimes <laughs> Um, many works in this genre recount high-profile sensational crimes such as the John Benet Ramsey killing, John Wayne Gacy, BTK killer, and O.J. Simpson murder case, and the Pamela Smart murder, while others are devoted to more obscure slayings. Um, true crime works uh, can impact the crimes they cover and the audience who consumes it. The genre is often criticized for being insensitive to the victims and their families and is described by some as trash culture. Yeah, I equate it to, like, you know, you would never go up nor would you ever be in a situation where you could go up and ask someone, damn, your daughter got murdered? Yeah. What happened? Yeah. That is so, you can't do that. I know, like, dude, so I heard that your daughter got poten- like allegedly stabbed by her husband. Is that correct? Yeah. It's like, that's so awful to ask but someone. How many times? Wait, <laughs> tell me. Yeah, Wait, yeah, do you have any pictures? Did she bleed out? God, it's just like you can't. Yeah. But there is this insatiable need to know. Yeah. Um. 
and and I think that it's just rubbernecking to yeah. the nth degree. It's rubbernecking, and we've somehow made it culturally okay yeah. where there's an avenue where you can ask those questions and have that curiosity and you get the answers yeah so i get it i definitely get it i do too i feel like it's kind of a similar thing that what happens with like internet or like celebrities or like internet influencers where like these people are no longer real yeah so like you can ask like sort of invasive questions but you realistically would never ask that to anyone in real life right or, or that's how it happens online is we get comments that are just so are you out of your mind? Yeah. Why would you say that to someone? And it's because of that. There is a screen, yeah. literally, in mm-hmm. between you and them. They just so. don't realize. Like, I was talking about this the other day. This is a sidebar. But, like, I went on a date with a girl one time who said that her sister hated me. And oh. she had me blocked. Oh. And so, at the end of the day, she FaceTimes her sister. And oh. her sister's just like, yeah, I don't like you. And I was what? like... <laughs> you didn't tell me that. And I was like... <laughs> The thing is, is like this woman, like it was it, the thing, like it. I understand if you don't like my content, but like imagine, like imagine you're on a date with someone, and then someone's like, "Yeah, my sister went through like your social media to 2017. She hates you." Like that. Keep would be, it to yourself, maybe. By the way, that'd be such a weird thing. She went on a date with you just to be able to say that to you. Yeah. No, my family fucking hates you, dude. Oh, dude. You sometimes. Suck. Yeah. Sometimes I see like influencers where they they took a picture with someone, and then the person like who posted the picture is like, <laughs> "I fucking hate this person." <laughs> Or like, what's your name again? I just recognize you from TikTok. Yeah, that's the worst. Yeah. So humbled. I know. Yeah, it's like that one time um, at VidCon, this girl came up to me. She was a very sweet girl, but she's like, I love your music. And I was like, <laughs> I, was like hey, I have never sang like, for, like ever before. You just got to say thanks, take the picture and go. <laughs> yes, yeah. You know? Yes. But yeah, so back to true crime. It just feels like these people ask these questions because they're cannot, they don't understand that these people are real. Yeah. 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 Yes. It's also... I mean, again, this is a common theme on this podcast is um, we really encourage touching grass. We encourage leaving the confines of your mother's basement, wiping the crumbs from your neck beard (laughs) and seeing the sun during the day. (laughs) We really encourage that, you know, put the Mountain Dew down. It's going to be okay. And part of that is, you know, there are certain social customs online that have somehow become normal. Yeah. Shit like that. Yes. Or the comments under something like this. If complex or npr post something like serial killers are up 20 percent yeah and one of the comments is like why is he kind of hot yeah it's like you could never (laughs) this would never have been allowed to flourish if the internet weren't there dude imagine your aunt got killed and you're in the courtroom and your friend turns to you because she's there for emotional support and she's like why is he kind of hot that's Wild. You'd be like, can you just like keep that thought to yourself? I'm like, ha- gonna kill you. Yeah, <laughs> yes. but I kind of understand like true crime that talks about very old crimes. Yeah, and very, like if you're talking about the Hindenburg and making jokes, I'm like, I'm okay with that. But the idea of someone who maybe got murdered last year and you're like, you know, she shouldn't have been what? Like, I'm like, it's just not. Yeah, what, yeah. What, it's not the comedy you think it is. Yeah. Even things like the Black Dahlia murder, where it's like you don't even know their identity. Yeah, and it still feels kind of. It feels okay to talk about it, but it's still icky because it's like, that was a human being. Yeah. It's still, it's some level of permission, but it's still like, ugh. Yeah. So, anyway, keeping all that in mind, we're going to go into the history of, mm. I guess, morbid curiosity is yes. really what it is. So, the human obsession with morbid curiosity dates back pretty far, um, around like circa 1617. And please forgive me. Zhang Yingyu's The Book of Swindles, um, which is a late Ming Dynasty collection of stories about allegedly true cases of fraud. This is the 1600s. Mm-hmm. Um, hundreds of pamphlets, broadsides, chapbooks, and other street literature about murders and other crimes were published from 1550 to 1700 in Britain as literacy increased and cheap new printing methods became widespread. Mm-hmm. They varied in style. Some were sensational, while others conveyed a moral message. So I get that. You know, you want to maybe retell in a dramatic way, something that's happened to teach a lesson to kids or to whatever, to like be safer. Most were purchased by the artisan class and above as the lower classes did not have the money or time to read them. (laughs) And they didn't know how. (laughs) Ballads were also created, the verses of which were posted on walls around towns that were told from the perpetrator's point of view in an attempt to understand the psychological motivations of the crime. Oh my God, imagine making a, a musical of your slaughtering. Like, and then it doing well. Yeah, but it's written from the point of view of your murderer. <laughs> you kick Mama Mia and Wicked off the stage. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's just like, you killing people? It's Broadway, Sarah Shower's murder. That's wild. <laughs> yes, that's actually kind of crazy. That is 
really oh my god to understand the psychological motivations of the crime yeah because if anything we need to sympathize with the killer yeah i i don't understand this why would they do this i don't know <laughs> it's the whole premise of silence of the lambs mm-hmm. I've, <gasps> I've why'd ne- you do it i've never actually seen that really that's the one with the lotion in the hole yeah yeah and the jodie foster and yes. the lotion in the hole <laughs> yes wait was it jodie foster in the hole yeah, with the lotion. She had to cover herself in lotion? No, I don't think so. Wait, no, no. Who is, was in the hole? Doesn't he... You, I just said I didn't. I've never seen it. Um, I've seen holes. Love that. Um, <laughs> anyway, let's keep going. I don't even know what I was talking about just now. Um, we were talking about... Sorry, we had to cut because Britain got hit by a car. Um, yeah. No, no, no. We were talking about who fell in the hole, and it's Brooke Smith. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I forgot. So it wasn't Jodie Foster that was putting lotion on. No, Brooke Smith is the... Oh, my God. I don't even know if that's the actor. Brooke Smith played... Hannah Montana's mom. <laughs> Brooke Smith is not Jodie Foster. <laughs> Which? Wait, that's Brooke. Brooke. <laughs> Brooke Shields. You're thinking. Brooke Shields. No, Brooke Shields is different from Brooke Smith. Brooke Smith is a. I. I just her face looks like any any other white woman. Oh. I couldn't describe She's her. She's just like me for real. Yeah, <laughs> but she has brown hair. Oh. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, starting in 1889, Scottish lawyer William Roughhead wrote and published. Nice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he used his teeth. Um, <laughs> And published essays for six decades about notable British murder trials he attended, with many of these essays collected in the 2000 book Classic Crimes. Love that one. Classic Crimes. Everybody mm-hmm. knows them. I feel like it's in one of those like huge books, like the um, yeah. the world record books. What is it? Uh, Ripley's. Ripley's. Yeah, or the Ripley's Believe It or Not thing, or like the Guinness World Records. There's like pop-ups in it. Yeah, it's just like a murder scene, but there's like a pop-up. And- yeah. There's a puzzle that you have to do. <laughs> yes. It sings on a certain page. <laughs> From the perspective of the murderer <laughs> to teach us a lesson in psychology. Exactly. Yes. Um, so an American pioneer of the genre was Edmund Pearson, who was influenced in his style of writing about crime by De Quincey. Pearson published a series of books of this type, start, uh, starting with Studies in Murder in 1924 and concluding with More Studies in Murder in 1936. Murder and more murder. I like that he didn't go murder too. Yeah. He went more murder study. Murder too. It's real this <laughs> <Yes>. time. Yes. <laughs> The foreword of a 1964 anthology of Pearson stories contains an early mention of the term true crime as a genre. Mm -hmm. Truman Capote's... Capote? Capote. Capote. Coyote. (laughs) His nonfiction novel, In Cold Blood, uh, published in 1965, is usually credited with establishing the modern novelistic style of the genre and the one that rocketed it to great profitability. Also... I want to read this, first of all. Okay. I've never read it. Uh-huh. I feel like it's terribly hard to read, probably. <laughs> it's not old English. It's 1965. Oh, dude. They were so pretentious <laughs> yes. back then. Using a thousand words to describe, like, murder. someone's dress. Yes. Yeah, murder. <laughs> like, there's like a thousand words in the book. Um, also, Stanley didn't include this in the research since it's fiction, and we're focusing on nonfiction, but... Even before In Cold Blood, authors like Arthur Conan Doyle and Edgar Allan Poe really incorporated that morbid curiosity and like subject matter into their works. I mean, when you think about Sherlock Holmes solving these criminal mysteries and Edgar Allan Poe's like The Raven and all of his famous poems are so dark. And that's why people like them. And that's why um, even um, Alfred Hitchcock and things like that, it's just so influenced by that just crime and just dark nature of the human spirit. I think that... It deserves a notable mention. Obviously, we're not, it's not true crime, yeah. but it's cool to see how real life events, not cool, let me retract that. It's interesting yeah. to see how real life events and the horror of what humans can do to each other has inspired and intertwined with what becomes popular in pop culture. Yeah. You know, of, of inspiring movies and, and fiction books and uh-huh. things like that. Even music. I mean, it's really interesting yeah. how we what we find inspiration in so i thought that was obviously mm-hmm. we wouldn't include that because it's fiction but it's still interesting yeah i think about that all the time with like doctor shows yeah where like you have to i have like a doctor like probably advise you know what you're writing because it just uh, could quickly not make sense yeah but i imagine like the doctors are like telling like actual stories that they've encountered sure you know and i'm like oh that's you know my butt plug being stuck in my butt could inspire right. the next house episode right yeah. right Oh, that would be so cool. I know. I actually inspired an episode of House. Or yeah, or like Law and Order SVU. It always is like it's this is like based off a true story, but not it's an actual. That's yeah. Yeah, the mm-hmm. victim was found with a Elmer's glue stick in her hole. Yes. Yeah. Um, so there are forms of distribution. 
It's going to make me mute about magazines. Uh, magazine, the first true crime magazine, True Detective, was published in 1924. It featured fairly matter-of-fact accounts of crimes and how they were solved. Uh, during the genre's heyday before World War II, 200 different true crime magazines were sold on newsstands. That's simply too much. Yeah. 200? Yeah. Um, with 6 million magazines sold every month. Well, I guess, you know, people are eating it up. The wow. covers of the magazines generally featured women being menaced in some way by potential <gasps> crime criminal perpetrator, with the scenarios being more intense in the 1960s. Just once, a yeah. man being menaced. <laughs> yes, a man. That's yes. all we'd like to see. What is, like, the like the 60s were, like, the decade of love, but just, like, all the true crime gets horrific? Actually, dude, there's so many, there's so many horrible things that happened in the 60s. Yeah. Because, like, hitchhiking. Yeah. That's crazy. I went on a date with a girl who said that she's hitchhiked in the past year. And I was like, "There's oh my God, who am I dating? But like, um, <laughs> yeah, maybe that's just, some introspection needs to go on. But like, I was like, do you like, have you ever like, like, have you ever heard of murder? You know, yeah. I would be too scared. Was she ugly? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> they don't like the ugly ones. I, I, I think they go for, you know. Anyone. Anyone. Yeah. yeah. As yeah. long as they're hitchhiking. That's true. I feel like also around this time, just historically speaking, like pop culture historically, was this like Creature from the Black Lagoon, mm -hmm. King Kong, things like that, where it's always a woman getting like yeah. gripped <laughs> by the big gorilla or well, whatever. It's, it's a, like the damsel in distress. It is. You know. But they die. Yeah. <laughs> You don't want like a, distress. like a dunce in distress. Yeah. Because like if you saw like a, I'm, honestly, if a man got like picked up by a large ape and like killed, <gasps> I'd be like, damn. He's dead. <laughs> yeah. No one's going to save him. Um, there are books on true crime um, often center the sensational, shocking or strange events, particularly murder. Even though murder makes up less than 20 percent of reported crime, it is present in most true crime stories. Yeah, because what the fuck? Yeah. Imagine like a book of jaywalking. Right. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> of shoplifting from Walmart. <laughs> yes. No one wants to hear about that. Unless you're teaching me how to do it. Yeah. Um, typically, these book reports on a crime from the beginning of its investigation to its legal proceedings, serial killers have a highly profitable subgenre. Uh, some true crime works are instant books produced quickly to capitalize on popular demand. These have been described as more than formulaic and hyper conventional. Others may reflect years of thoughtful research and inquiry and may have considerable literary merit. There is Norman Mailer's The Executioner's Song from 1979, which was the first book in the genre to win a Pulitzer Prize. Wow. That's, that's really something. Uh, Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, the best-selling true crime book of all time. It details the 1959 murders of four members of the Clutter family in the small farming community of Holcomb, Kansas. The armpit of America. And the um, What's that called? Tornado Alley? Kansas? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it crazy? The U.S. is the only country with all natural disasters. Sounds about right. Yeah. And, like, it's crazy what you have to worry about. I've never worried about um, a tornado, but hurricanes, definitely. Yeah. We had to worry. We had tornado drills in uh, North Texas. Really? Yeah. What'd you do for him? Just lay down. <laughs> <laughs> Walk outside yeah. and just like, let the Lord take you. Honestly, that's the redneck thing. <laughs> What's that noise? It's a tornado siren. Get inside. Yes. Um, Shoot at it. Yes. <laughs> And rules the stranger beside me about Ted Bundy. Um, all Which, oh my God, we could do a whole fucking episode on people's obsession with Ted Bundy. Uh, yeah, they like. Uh, it's kind of crazy to me why women are like they're like you, they're hot. Like, why would you say that he's hot? Yeah, you know he killed women. Yeah, like you would have been a victim, babe. I, he's not hot. I think that they're just like. I could change him, or like he wouldn't kill me. You know, like or, or like it's the. I think it's the charm and charisma. It's, it's that, yeah, it's like I would be the one yeah. he would fall in love with or whatever. Yeah, that like romanticizing of. Yeah. <gasps> he would kill you. I'm so yeah, sorry. You would be dead. <gasps> Holy fuck. Who was I talking to? Who was I talking to? Hurry, hurry. Oh my God. Okay, we were on tour and we were at, uh, I think it was West Palm Beach. That girl who came up to us and she was like, yeah, I went to, I flew down here from Wisconsin. Yeah. And she, they used to rent, like her school used to rent out. That's right. Jeffrey Dahmer's apartment and they, they used to kill people in. They would throw parties there. God, dude. You, that is fucked up. That's wild. I know. I was like, uh, that that was fucking wild to hear. Yeah. I guess what else do you do in Wisconsin though? Eat cheese and party in Jeffrey Dahmer's apartment? Tip a cow. 
Oh, I guess you could. Yeah. Tractor tipping. My, um, I had a vine one time about cow tipping because my grandma, um, the cows would lay down in like the winter and then the cat would come lay where the cow was because it was warm, but then the cow would return to where it was sitting and uh, the cat was crushed up against the cow. It died. But like, um. Simply move. Yeah. You know? <laughs> move. <laughs> Sorry. Um, where does a cow eat lunch? The, at the cow cafe. <laughs> at the cafe. Oh, uh, I was almost I was almost there. I'm so sorry. I was hit with a shovel when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs>time fan of the pod, you know I speak Spanish, but sometimes I wish I'd picked up another language on top of it, like Italian. They're very similar, and I wish I was able to immerse myself in the culture the way I can with Spanish. So if you're like me and there's a foreign language that you regret not learning in school, it's never too late to start with Babbel. Babbel is the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions. Thanks to Babbel's addictively fun and easy bite-sized language lessons, you can finally cross learning that new language off your list. With Babbel, you only need 10 minutes to complete a lesson, so you can start having real-life conversations in a new language in as little as three weeks. Other language learning apps use AI for their lesson plans, but Babbel lessons were created by over 150 language experts and voiced by real native speakers, not computers. Their teaching method has been scientifically proven to be effective. With Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages, including, but not limited to, Spanish, French, Italian, and German. Plus, Babbel's speech recognition technology helps you to improve your pronunciation and accent. One of the most important parts, I would argue. There are so many ways to learn with Babbel. In addition to lessons, you can access podcasts, games, videos, stories, and even live classes. Plus, it comes with a 20-day money-back guarantee. So what are you waiting for? Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, get up to 55% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash VCG. That's babbel.com slash VCG for up to 55% off your subscription. Babbel, language for life. Hey guys, Brittany here. Now listen, before you book any brunch, you pour over lists and lists of reviews. So why not do the same when you're booking a doctor's appointment? With ZocDoc, you can see real verified patient reviews to help find the right doctor for you. ZocDoc is a free app that shows you doctors who are patient-reviewed, take your insurance, and are available when you need them. On ZocDoc, you can find every specialist under the sun, whether you're trying to straighten those teeth, fix an achy back, get that mole checked out, or anything else. ZocDoc has you covered. Lord knows I've got enough skin issues on my own, and I've used ZocDoc before to find a dermatologist I can trust. ZocDoc's mobile app is as easy as ordering a ride to a restaurant or getting delivery to your house. Search, find, and book doctors with a few taps. Find and review local doctors. Read verified patient reviews. Now, when you walk into that doctor's office, you're all set to see someone in your network who gets you. Every month, millions of people use ZocDoc, and I'm one of them. It's my go-to whenever I need to find and book a quality doctor. So go to ZocDoc.com slash VCG and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then start your search for a top-rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash VCG. ZocDoc.com slash BCG. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, There's some also- more notable <laughs> books <Yes. laughs> are um, Eric Larson's The Devil in the White City, which is crazy tea. What is it about? It's about H.H. H. Holmes, who, um, if y'all don't know about H.H. H. Holmes, he was like a serial killer in the active in Chicago in the late 1890s around the um, World's Fair. Uh-huh. And there is an incredible series of episodes on H.H. H. Holmes on the podcast, last podcast on the left. Uh-huh. Have you ever listened to them? No. It's uh, three comedians, male, uh-huh. and they are so funny. And what I appreciate about them is, is they pick these old ones, you uh-huh. know, like the old 1890s. Like, obviously, no one's alive who could remember it. But it's not so much making fun of it it's making fun of him as a serial killer like you are such a loser dude yeah you're gonna like this is what you dedicate your life to Mm -hmm. and he was a swindler and all this it's it's very i mean i the first time i listened to these episodes i was driving on my way to work at my awful insurance job and i was crying laughing to the point where i had to pull over on the side of the road because i couldn't see i was laughing so hard yeah like it is 
oh my god, it's so good. I can't recommend it enough. So if you, I mean, obviously you're you're listening to this episode, you have an interest somewhat yeah. in you know, true crime. I would really recommend it because he sucks, first of all, H.H. H. Holmes. Uh-huh. And then, um, God, some of the shit he got up to. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy, man. He, did he? How many people did he kill? I don't know, but he built this. It's called the Murder Hotel, uh-huh. which is what AHS Hotel was kind of based on. Wait, the Cecil Hotel is in Los Angeles. Uh-uh, that's different. So the a- uh, hotel was based on the Cecil Hotel. Oh, T. Oh, yeah. The AHS? Yeah. T. Well, well I mean... Slay. Uh-huh. There's a bunch of, um, in the murder hotel, H.H. H. Holmes, he would hire contractors to, like, build certain parts of this hotel, fire them, say that their work was insufficient or whatever. They would, uh, and then hire other contractors. That way he never had to pay anyone. Uh-huh. Seems like your work is subpar. Built this entire hotel, doors that led to nowhere, stairs that led to secret rooms, like, vaults, chambers, like, very scary rooms that no no, no one, hey, yeah. no <laughs> one knew how to get to. Um, and he would, like, kill people and leave their bones in there. And when he was finally caught, or I don't, if he died, I don't remember. Um, oh, my God, when the police found this hotel. Yeah. Wild, wild. I really, it's that shit where it's like, how does the human brain even come up with how to hurt people in that way? Yeah. I mean, I assume it's like asbestos and all the mercury and this. And I would agree. They're applying like lead directly to their <laughs> eyeballs. <laughs> Dude, yeah. if the boomer generation has like lead poisoning, can you even imagine oh, their parents? Oh my God. <laughs> I'm surprised they can speak. <laughs> no, yeah. Like, you know what I always think about? Um, if you were a murderer back in the day and you got caught, you're actually a fucking idiot. Because yeah. there was. It was so easy. There was no like fingerprints. No. And like, if they got like your. Fucking if no, there was no like DNA. So like if they got your fingerprints, you'd like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You had to want to get caught. Yeah, back then because it was so easy. Probably I know. And then it's just so fucking stupid. You actually were stupid. Yeah. Anyway, uh, really recommend last podcast on the left. They're Mm -hmm. they're really funny. In two (laughs) thousand six. Associated content stated that since the start of the 21st century, the genre of writing that was growing the quickest was true crime. The majority of readers of true crime books are women. Go figure. And there are lots of interesting analyses that I found online and also what Stanley linked in here. Um, And there is a book by Laura Browder in which she says, The interviews I conducted with a group of true crime fans suggest that many of them read true crime to help themselves cope with the patriarchal violence they have encountered in the past and fear in the present. Yeah, honestly. Absolutely. Yeah, like, I mean, I could understand if you're trying to, like, learn how to be safer. Like, it makes sense that men wouldn't care as much. Yeah. Because they run at night with headphones on and no mace. Yeah. Because they don't have to worry about it. So, like, it's just a way to... In a, like a way to like uh, arm yourself with like knowledge. Absolutely, yeah. It's arming yourself with knowledge, um, and a, a sense of not comfort, but I guess being seen. Yeah, you know, like that that fear you have of going out alone. Yeah, is valid because this shit happens, mm-hmm. and I think that it's important to talk about. But I think that the level, as with anything, mm-hmm. the internet has taken it to a level that is. Um, dismissive of the original intention yeah you know like it's it helps to be in the know of how these people do it you know like and i see it on tiktok all the time of putting zip ties on someone's car Mm -hmm. to mark that car to know like follow her when she leaves her she leaves her job at this time yeah that shit like these are all ploys that people like this use when they want to harm someone i mean don't have to think about it so of course it, it makes sense but it's also like and then they did what yeah and where was her body <laughs> shit I mean, there is, like, some good advice from, like, true crime people. Like, I, um, some lady was like, you know, if a man is asking you for help, he's probably going to do something horrible. Yes. Because men literally never ask for help. Exactly. A man comes up to you in the grocery store parking lot, and he looks, like, able-bodied, and he, he's like, can you help me with my groceries? A man doesn't even ask help, like, ask for, di- 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 a man it. doesn't even ask for directions. Period. Why would he help you with his fucking, like, ask, need help with groceries? Period. You know what I mean? Why would that be where he stoops down to yeah. ask for help? Very valid. Um, so we talked about books. There's also films and television. True crime documentaries have been a growing medium in the last several decades. I would say consistently number one on Netflix. Yeah. One of the most influential documentaries in this process was The Thin Blue Line, directed by Errol Errol Morris. Mm-hmm. This documentary, among others, features reenactments. Uh, and although other documentary filmmakers choose not to use them since they dramatize the truth, yeah. this one, for whatever reason, did use it. 
Other prominent documentaries include Paradise Lost, The Child Murders at Robin Hood Hills, Making a Murderer, which was crazy. Uh-huh. The internet was wild when that came out. Mm-hmm. The Jinx and The Keepers. The Keepers, dude? What is The Keepers? Oh, my God. It's about abuses within the Catholic Church uh-huh. and um, murders. Yes. And it is, oh, my God. It's one of those, like, when there's religion attached to it. Yeah, that scares me shitless. Yes. And the abuse that some of these women went through is just, uh Missing women, stuff like that. Nuns. Yeah. Like, like nuns and school children. Wild. Oh. So dark. So. Uh. Anyway, there's so many more. Um, in the early 1990s, a boom of true crime films began in Hong Kong as well. Podcasts, if you want to take that. Um, so, yeah. Podcasts with a true crime theme are a recent trend. The 2014 true crime podcast Serial broke podcasting records when it achieved 5 million downloads on iTunes quicker than any previous podcast. Um, as of September 2018, it has been downloaded more than 340 million times. Did you ever listen to this? Uh, no. It was wild. I think I listened to My Favorite Murder because my ex did, and so we just would listen every time it came out. But I kind of stopped listening because I love... Love is a strong word. I like them, but they spend a solid... Thir- okay, as people who ramble, <laughs> they spend a solid 30 minutes of the beginning of the podcast just talking about themselves. I'm like, get yeah. to the point. Yeah. No, I would... Yeah. That was a reason why I stopped listening. Yeah. I feel like the difference, though, is when you structure it as, all right, we're going to tell you guys about yeah. this thing, and we have this prepared for today. You know, it's like, get to it. But yeah. the more it grows and the more that their personalities come through, I get, well, maybe they were just listening to fans. You yeah. Know, they're like, I wish you guys would just talk about your weeks more. We get that comment a lot. Yeah. And it's like, we live together. I don't, there's nothing to talk about. Yeah. Like I saw you in a moo Yeah. Yesterday, today. Leaving the bathroom. Yeah. And, and then you had to walk by the bathroom. <laughs> yes. And there's really nothing to discuss there. <laughs> yes. My eyelashes melted off. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. So I feel like that is, that happens with a lot of, I, I don't know. I appreciate a podcast. Which is why we wanted to do something like this that teaches, yeah, you know, or informs. And if there's room for banter, there is. But I agree yeah. about my favorite murder. I was like, Ugh. yeah, I just think like so the they basically tell like about like murders and it's like a story, you know. Like imagine if someone was like, I have to tell you the story of John Benet Ramsey, but here is thirty minutes <laughs> of what I did this week, and I totally understand that they were probably listening to fans. But you're like. All right. Yeah, fast, 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 what fast, is fast, happening? Fast, fast, fast. But yes, they seem like nice people, and I'm sorry, guys. Yeah. Um, they were, I would say, though, Serial was a trendsetter in itself to mm-hmm. really popularize true crime yeah. and, and tap into that market that I feel like in the podcasting space, no one really had before. My Favorite Murder was the first to make it like a comedy. Yeah. Which is on paper so yeah. awful. Yeah. But I mean, one of the most successful podcasts ever, I would argue. So they tapped into some market there as well that no one had done before. So it's it's interesting to see how it develops. Mm -hmm. I like, um, I know I've definitely bought their book. So like they probably make a lot of money. We should write a book. We should. Yeah. Trixie and Kati can do it. They can't even read. (laughs) I was gonna say, we have to learn how to read first. Damn. Yes. (laughs) Um, Anyway, it has been, so Serial was one of the first ones, like we said. It's been followed by other true crime podcasts such as Dirty John, which was wild too. What is Dirty John? Dirty John was about just this dude named John. People killed in a porta potty. (laughs) Sorry, (laughs) sorry, sorry, sorry. (laughs) You're not wrong. Um, Just this like crazy dude named John in some podunk town. Yeah, it's a wild story. and it was just some guy that went out there. It, one of those th- ones where they go out and just talk to rednecks and kind of yeah. make fun of them. But uh-huh. it's like there's something deeper here. Yeah. My Favorite Murder, uh, Last Podcast on the Left, That's Why We Drink, Up and Vanished. And then podcast series such as Cults, Female Criminals, and Mind's Eye, Someone Knows Something, and many more. Mm-hmm. Podcasts have now expanded to more sites such as Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, where you can find our <laughs> podcast. As like well. and subscribe. Yeah, <laughs> if you guys want to leave a comment, too. Mm-hmm. And many more. They exist to provide others an easy way to learn about true crime murders and mysteries. Because why would I want to learn it the hard way? Yeah. <laughs> the hard way. You get murdered. You get murdered. I learned it the hard way. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Spotify has an expanding number of true crime podcasts with Rotten Mango, Conviction, American Panic, Bed of Lies, Catch and Kill, among many more. This genre has been on the rise as psychologist Amanda Vickery said her report found women were most drawn to cr- true crime stories that gave them tips for spotting danger and staying alive. Period. Yeah. Um, it's been speculated that fear could play a role in the popularity of true crime podcasts. Yeah. What's that thing? Keep 
your friends close, but your enemies closer. Yeah. Like information about serial killers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, these podcasts often recount horrific crimes, which triggers the fear response and the release of adrenaline in the body. Oh, you guys are all adrenaline junkies. That yeah. makes sense. You guys should try skydiving. That's why you guys want to listen to us talk about bronies. <laughs> adrenaline junkies. <laughs> what did they do next? <laughs> <laughs> and then what? <laughs> Show the fan art. <laughs> uh, due to the possibility of br- uh, binging podcasts, adrenaline rushes can be experienced in quick bursts. Another explanation of the popularity of true crime podcasts is due to the serialized nature of crime in which events happen one after another. Easy um, to follow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, podcasts that explore a crime episodically can utilize this aspect in their storytelling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the real life impact, which, I mean, is... V- How do you define it? Because there's so many, you know, are these stories inspiring people to repeat them? Yeah. Are they fear mongering? Mm -hmm. Are they really, you know, just inspiring people to be more well protected? Yeah. Um, It's a whole different, it's a whole spectrum of like how something this dark Uh can affect the human psyche. When when you listen to it like that, so every Monday, you know, it's crazy. So the investigative process of the true crime genre can lead to changes in the cases being covered, mm-hmm. which is wild. Yeah. When you get the internet involved, which we did an, uh, an episode on mm-hmm. crimes solved by the internet. If yeah. you guys want to listen to that too. Very interesting. Um, such as when Robert Durst seemingly confessed to murder in the documentary The Jinx and was arrested. Like what? In the middle of an ongoing investigation. Yeah. A study conducted in 2011 in Nebraska showed that consuming nonfiction crime shows, aka true crime, is correlated with an increased fear of being a victim of crime. As the frequency of watching true crime shows increased, support for the death penalty increased, while support for the criminal justice system decreased. Because you see how fucking flawed it is. Yeah. Oh, that is so fucking... Should that... Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, I mean, increased fear of being a victim of a crime. I don't know. I feel like... I'm trying to think about back before true crime. I mean, I was just always super afraid of men, too. Yeah. Like, even before that, I don't... I actually can't gauge if the severity of, like, my fear of men has increased. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think it's... You're told from even being a little girl, you know, to be cautious Mm -hmm. of where you are and who's around you. And men, men aren't taught that. Yeah. So, this definitely... I talk about this with my mom sometimes because I don't know if... Do you have any living grandparents? No. My grandparents are very... My grandma and my Mimi mm-hmm. in particular is so terrified yeah. of the world. Uh huh. And I don't know if we've discussed this on the podcast before, but the worldview that old people are fed uh-huh. via Facebook and via Fox News and even CNN, I mean, they're all the same, is so not realistic yeah and if you don't have the brain power or the knowledge to get online and get a more accurate depiction of you know how the world is even though the internet's not much of an upgrade because of doom scrolling yeah like that is such a terrifying mental state to exist in at all times my grandma is constantly sending me facebook links of girl abducted here they're using this don't if they put a 20 dollar bill under your windshield wiper they're trying to kill you yeah they're gonna put you in the van yeah you know if you don't let them get you in that van <laughs> yes. i'm like baby it's tuesday on a, it's 10 a.m it's a mazda how dangerous yeah. could it be it's not a van yes. he was driving an suv <laughs> so it's like to constantly live in that state of mm-hmm. and, and to worry about, you know, your daughter or your grandchild is I can't imagine. And it's such a warped view yeah. of reality. I, that is wild mm-hmm. that old people are obviously victims of it. Yeah. Um, but that worldview is curated for them. Yeah. It's it's wild. So I think that we're kind of victims of that as well mm-hmm. as women or, you know. Yes. Yeah, I think like um, also they weren't raised with the Internet. So it's just like it seems like they're being bombarded with like horrific stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's also a lot of people who are like on the Internet now. Like it's like there are a lot of horrible events happening. But the thing is, is that they probably happened in the same amount. Um, It's just like now we know about them. Exactly. You know, your Graham Graham used to live in complete ignorance, you know, bliss. But little did she know there's probably like four murderers in her town. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. Have you ever looked at that? uh, predator like map yeah oh my god finding out how many people are predators in your fucking wish i didn't know it's crazy yeah uh, uh, who uh live around a school yeah wild well i guess they can't if you're a registered sex offender you can't live within what how many miles of a school i think it's like a hundred feet the thing is is like 
you do you is it any kid because i imagine walking down the street must be difficult even if it's not near a school if you see know. a child do you have to cross the street I mean, I oh, see I'm preteens sure and I always cross the street. <laughs> but that's out of fear, yeah. not out of want. <laughs> your ankles are so thick. Stop! Oh, please, I'm please. scared. <laughs> I'm doing my hot girl walk. Why is your body lumpy? <laughs> yes. oh, no. There is criticism, obviously. Um, the true crime genre has been criticized as being disrespectful to uh, crime victims and their families. Author Jack Miles believes this genre has a high potential to cause harm and mental trauma to the real people involved. Yeah, like, sometimes I'll see something that I don't know how to feel, like... Okay, so on TikTok, like, the best friend of someone who's been murdered will, like, post this, like, funny, like, poking fun of, like, you know her, like, she would have wanted this, I'm coping with humor. Mm. And while coping with humor is a valid thing to do, and I don't imagine that the rest of her family is as well. Yeah. So uh, yeah. just because you cope with humor, like, I feel like you should probably not. Yeah. You know? Or just joke privately in your own home. Don't exactly. Don't post it on the internet. Because that shit does not go away. Yeah. And once it's out there, you can't take it back. So mm. that is... Yeah, I see that a lot. Or they use like a viral audio to talk about some of the most horrific trauma I have ever seen. Yeah. So it's interesting. True crime media can be produced without the consent of the victim's family. Yeah, which Mm -hmm. uh, can lead them to being re-traumatized. Yeah, dude, imagine scrolling. I mean, I already like get kind of nervous when I'm scrolling my For You page and I see a video about you. And uh, <laughs> and it's just me murdering someone. You no, know, it's literally always like a good thing. Or like I saw like a video of like someone who was at like an airport like baggage claim, and they saw you and videoed you. <laughs> I'm just like I'm, I'm nervous that someone's gonna like I don't know do something weird uh, talking about you, and it's like usually a nice thing. But I imagine that, you know it could easily cross over if like it's negative. It's just like uncomfortable to see. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Um. Depending. I don't think that you're a murderer. <laughs> yes. Good. <laughs> I know. You'll, you'll never guess what happened next. <laughs> that smell in the house, I just think it's your bathroom. Yeah, just don't open that closet door if you don't mind. Mm-hmm. Depending on the writer, true crime can adhere strictly to well-established facts in journalistic fashion or it can be highly speculative. Mm-hmm. Writers can selectively choose which information to present and which to leave out in order to support their narrative. Artists have offered... Fact-based narratives blending fiction and historical reenactment. I've always found those to be so cheese. Yeah. Like the reenactments of, <gasps> or the, the yeah. um. You ever watch those haunting shows um, where like they're like Bly Manor? Oh, I don't know. What oh, that are is. you talking about like true haunting or yeah, like okay, where it's yeah. like real people recounting? I lived at this address and it is so haunted. Yeah. This would happen. Da da da. And they find people that look kind of like the real person and they yeah. completely reenact it. It's like the faucets would turn on and then you see dramatically like yeah. <laughs> turning on. a dish would fly across the room and then you see it yeah. and then like a woman being like <laughs> it's just like you ruined it yeah. you blew it well it's like the same thing with like civil war reenactments like they yeah. fire the guns and they drop and you're like I mean I, this is cheesy you know yeah Make it more believable. Yeah, really kill real him. Guns, yeah. <laughs> he shoot him with a cannon. Put the bayonet in his face. <laughs> like, the thing is, is uh, you're talking about like how it's like a reenactment. I I hate when they blend fiction and like uh, historical. Like um, Quentin Tarantino does that a lot with his mm. movies. He did that for Inglorious Bastards, mm-hmm. where like it was like a fictional way that Hitler died. And you're I was telling me Brad Pitt wasn't a Nazi he, killer. He wasn't actually. He, his accent in that movie is atrocious. <laughs> Yeah. That is a blend of like four different southern accents. Yeah. Appalachia is so easily like you can whatever. But um yeah, like I'm like this is kind of cheesy. I feel like cuz it's obviously like him trying to be like this is what I would do in this situation. Right. Like it's like oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. Prove it. Yes. Show us. Go back in time. Yeah. But um, so there is the true crime internet community, the true crime community. Um sometimes ref- I just lick this microphone. Why did I do that? Sorry, Studio 71. <laughs> One time I kissed my mom on the mouth and I accidentally stuck my tongue out. Why did you, so why would you say that? I don't know. I just felt like I should be honest. Okay. Um she uh, No one was asking for it. I was a kid. Um so sometimes <laughs> referred to as the true crime fandom is an online community which focuses on mass murderers, serial killers, and similar criminals. This is gonna be weird. Okay. Whenever someone's like there's like a mass murder and it's two people, I kind of I'm like, is it? You know, uh, maybe I'm too literal about the situation. What do you mean? I assume mass is like more than 10. Oh, you mean when there's only two victims? Yeah. Like if you say a mass murder and... How many people usually attend a mass? <laughs> Catholic mass. <laughs> yes. 
It's at least 200 so people. Like two, oh. No, but I just, I so I didn't know that mass is just w- more than one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that is, yeah. Yeah. A few murder. Yeah. <laughs> a few murderer. A few murderer. Um, so notable subjects of focus include Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, Eric Harris, Dylan Klebold, James Holmes, and, oh. Oh, Jesus. Zotkar Sarsvenev. Sick Russian name. <laughs> I just said, like, fuck you backwards or something. <laughs> Just I summoned someone. There's too many Z's. There's only one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then Stanley comments, L people. Yes. And I agree. Um, the history of the true crime community can be considered a pre-internet phenomenon that was later brought to light by the internet. Uh, hi. Bur- can you say that? Hybristophilia. The sexual attraction to those who have committed some form of wrongdoing is a well-known phenomenon. Although the exact reason behind why it exists is unknown. I can tell you mental illness yeah and (laughs) tumblr.com wait that yeah so there's an actual word for being attracted to people who are like murderers hybristophilia just gave some of you bitches an identity (laughs) 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 the true crime community notably flourished due in part to the nature of websites such as tumblr Mm -hmm. which allow easy sharing of materials related to the true crime community which i mean (sighs) i wonder how tumblr reacts yeah like like uh, executives at tumblr like we got the Ted Bundy fan fiction going <laughs> yes. crazy right now. Hashtag Ted Bundy fic, just yes. number one trending. <laughs> like, just trying to delete it. Um, so the, wait, wait, wait. There are characteristics. <laughs> the true crime fandom shares many characteristics with other subcultures, notably in the way of fan works such as writings and fan art focused around its subjects. Dude, when I was on Tumblr, I literally used to see, and don't question what parts of the internet I was on because Lord knows I'm, I have my fingers in all of it. Yeah. Um, Richard Ramirez fan art. Oh yeah, like what's he, the Night Stalker? Yeah, Night, night something. Um, because they thought he was hot, and there would be gifts on my uh dashboard of like him in court. Yeah, with handcuffs and people being like, "Why does he look?" Okay. Yeah, I'm like, y'all are in- that's insane. Genuinely, what is that? Like you, uh, we said it like earlier. Like you, is you think that you're gonna be the only person not killed by this person, right? Or like, is it like how male validation is so intoxicating to the oh, point dude, where like that must be it. a powerful man in like the most literal sense, and that he killed people? Yeah, like the, you want him to like you. Yeah, that you're the exception, or yeah. something about you is different. He uh-huh. would pick you. I don't know, Could, but it's also like the Bonnie and Clyde nature of it all. Yeah, you know, maybe that adrenaline and that life on the edge sort of lifestyle is attractive. Yeah. I don't know. Uh-huh. You know, the, I, that's been talked about in music for a century, you mm-hmm. know, where it's like he's on, you're on the run with your boyfriend. Yeah. You robbed a bank. You did something. I don't know. Even like Beyonce did a, a yeah. Bonnie and Clyde sort of tribute with her and Jay-Z. It's like I there's something... I guess romanticized. Yeah, that's romantic about that. Your mm-hmm. boyfriend standing trial, mm-hmm. and he's your boyfriend. <laughs> Y'all love each other. He skinned three people alive. Yeah, but and not he me. Ate their hearts. Yeah, but he loves me. <laughs> he would never do that. He is not capable of love, sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> he mirrors love back to <laughs> yeah. me, and it's real sweet. Hey guys, Brittany here. Today's episode is sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. Y'all know we love Honey on this podcast and it always comes in handy since we almost exclusively shop online. Thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart automatically. So here's how it works. Imagine you're shopping on one of your favorite sites. When you go to check out, the Honey button appears, and all you gotta do is click Apply Coupons. Wait a few seconds as Honey searches for coupons it can find for that site, and if it finds a working one, you'll watch the prices drop. Sarah and I recently moved, and Honey actually saved me some cash on some new bedroom furniture I bought. It was about 10-15%, so thanks, Honey. Now, Honey doesn't just work on desktop, it works on your iPhone, too. Just activate it on Safari on your phone and save on the go. So if you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting the show. I'd never recommend something I don't use, so get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash vcg. That's joinhoney.com slash vcg. Hey, guys, one more time. It's Brittany. 
Do you ever see something online and you're not sure if that trending skin tint is really worth all the hype? You wish you could get that new moisturizer as soon as possible instead of waiting three to five days for shipping? If you're looking for an honest review on that new celebrity skincare line, with Flip, you can have all that and more. Flip is the latest beauty app that is shaking up the way you can shop for beauty and wellness. Imagine shopping on Sephora, but the reviews are detailed TikTok-style videos and the shipping is Amazon fast. What more could you want? Shopping on Flip means you are shopping directly from real, verified users of the product you're browsing. With over 500 brands available on Flip, you can shop all your favorite beauty brands and discover new Holy Grail products through the most honest and authentic reviews on the market. When you join Flip, you're joining a beauty rewards program unmatched by any other. Get rewarded for what you already do. Scroll, shop, vote, or post your own review all result in free shopping credits. This means you can save up to 30% off your purchase as you rack up rewards. You won't see that with Sephora or Ulta. With Flip, you can also get a premium shopping experience that offers free same-day shipping, easy returns, white glove customer service, and of course, those coveted earned rewards. I saved over 20% on my favorite Supergoop Mineral Sunscreen recently, and it was delivered so fast. So up your beauty shopping game with Flip. Download the Flip app for free today and save 30% on your first order with code VIOLATING. That's code VIOLATING for 30% off your first order. Code VIOLATING for 30% off your first Flip order. Thanks, guys. Our next partner has a product that I use literally every day. I started taking AG1 because I really seriously needed help on my gut health. I cannot even describe to you what the, the fragile ecosystem that's going on in my stomach lining. And AG1 has really helped turn this boat around, if you know what I mean. So what is this stuff? With one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole foods, sourced ingredients, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. All the things. All the things. All of those things all at once, all the time. I personally take AG1 in the morning because that's when I know when to do everything. It establishes my routine. It gets my day going. And I feel like when I eat later in the day, like I'll just be like, oh, yeah, I took it in the morning and I'll be fine. It's lifestyle friendly, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy free or gluten free, contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything while still tasting good. It also supports better sleep quality and recovery and also supports mental clarity and alertness. I am alarmingly alert right now. Athletic Greens also has over 7,000 five star reviews and is recommended by professional athletes. It's trusted by leading health experts such as Tim Ferriss and Michael Gervais. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs for your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash VCG. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash VCG to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Um, this aspect has proven controversial as it has been equated by some to an equal, equal to idolizing criminals. Yeah. Yeah. This claim is, I've seen so many fan edits on TikTok of like criminals. I'm like, oh my God. I get it if it's white collar crime. Cause it's like, fuck yeah, you cheated the system or like you stole from a corporation or whatever. Like the, the white man celebration of like a Jordan Belfort. Yeah. I, I kind of understand that. But when it's literally a Ted Bundy. Mm-hmm. What are we doing, dude? Well, I think white collar crime could like easily like you know it's a systemic issue sometimes too. Mm. So that could be you know I don't I don't even I I think it's just yeah yeah yeah. What did you just say about Ted Bundy? When people are making edits of Ted Bundy, it's like what are we doing? Yeah, that's not anything that I can even remotely start to understand. Yeah, other than you think he's physically attractive, but it's not just that. It's it's you think that him as a person and what he did is. Yeah. I don't get it. Yeah, Ted Bundy looks like he could work at, like, Six Flags. The most average, kind of ugly. Yeah, man. he's so ugly. And the fact that they use Zac Efron to, ah. like, play him, I was like, that's, what are you doing? Yeah. Doesn't make any sense. Um, the claim is typically countered by the claim that the fantasization, fantasi fascination is rooted in criminology as opposed to an ulterior motive. Mm. It's definitely both. Um, sub fandoms. Uh, there's the Columbine Massacre. The Columbine Massacre fandom is one of the largest, oldest, and best-known examples of the true crime. They killed 
teenagers wow. focused on the April 20th, 1999 mass murder of Columbine High School in Columbine, Colorado by Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. Um, participants in the fandom are commonly known as Columbiners. Jesus Christ. And are typically younger individuals who associate with Harris and Klebold as similarly misunderstood by the world. They were, j- they were just bigots. Yeah. Every like every time there's like a documentary like it you know they were bullied. No, they were bigots. Yeah. Yeah. You you were a hateful person. Yeah. To do something like that. Um the f- and I've also been bullied and treated horribly. Never have I ever brought a gun to school. Yeah. Well, thank God we got you out of school. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the fandom, I don't know if I can laugh at that. Um, the fandom has been the subject of numerous case studies. Yeah. It's also, I mean, there are people who take inspiration from these people. Yeah. And the only reason that happens is because the news networks and the journalists go into way too much detail on who these people are. Yeah. Their backgrounds. They were misunderstood. You know, they, they link to their Facebook that's still active. Yeah. And they see memes and th- and people find an identity and a connection in these people. Mm. Don't give it that power. The first time I saw that was um, on... Uh, during the pandemic, yeah, during the height of the Black Lives Matter protests, where it was all happening so rapidly, one after another, and all of the news articles would be focused on the person who who shot the gun, the yeah. person who did this, the person who did that. We should be talking about the victim. That mm-hmm. was the first time in my life that it was reframed like that. That was like, why are we giving it so much attention? Yeah, you are inspiring others, yeah, whether you meant to or not, because mm-hmm. you think you're. It's an uh, what's it called? Your journalistic integrity. Yeah, that you're reporting all the facts. We don't want to know the fucking facts of who did it. We want to know the victim and how we can help. Yeah, and so I feel like this is a bit. It can be solved. Mm-hmm. Stop fucking doing this. Mm-hmm. When this happens, I. You know, it's always and, and it's the whole idea of um, which pictures you use. Yeah. You use the white guy's, you know, graduation photo. Yeah, there's and he's that. so innocent. Oh, yeah, it's like or that. Oh, this is a horrible meme where it's like a white guy just killed his entire family and they use like the most recent like family vacation photo yep. of them like all riding dolphins. Yep. But then if it's a person of color, they use like a mugshot or like something taken from someone's Facebook. Yep. And it's like, why would you do that? Also, the fact that a lot of these like serial killers are or like mass shooters are white men. Yeah. That mu- that's because of entitlement. Yeah. You know, like you feel like the world has screwed you over and you're owed something yeah. to the point where like you feel and in- you feel like you can take someone's life. God. I mean, I feel like anyone uh, who's a woman or person of color can be like, yeah, dude, the world is fucking awful. But these men just can't accept that they weren't given everything on like a silver platter. Yeah. The first inconvenience yeah. or, or alert that the world is not how they saw it at first is just like, yeah, women reject you. Therefore, I get to kill people. Oh, God. Oh, my God. Work at a Sears. <laughs> Work at Baskin Robbins. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's like true crime, the judicial system and its effects uh, from 2018 to 2021. The number of documentary series on streaming services grew 63 percent. And true crime was the largest segment of that, according to data from Parrot Analytics, a media tracking company. This is an opinion piece by Vox, by the way. OK. Um, just want to throw that out there. This isn't like it's just an opinion piece. OK. Yeah. So it's not fact. Um, so true crime turns the courtroom into a source of entertainment and transforms people's lives into narratives for others to consume. Oh my God! Yeah, dude. Yeah. Um, the fucking Johnny Depp yep. Amber Heard trial. The, the it was disgusting. These the f- are people's lives. Yeah, like, and they're like, I'm in line to watch this. It's like get a job. Yeah. Again, Sears. <laughs> <laughs> like, what are you doing? That's this is real domestic violence, you shitheads. Yeah. All right. Um, the interest in other people's trauma, whether depicted through documentary footage or by actors, has real life ramifications. Yep. Our obsession does have an effect on the court system in both positive and negative ways. It can encourage public advoc- advocacy that illuminates the cases of marginalized defendants or victims. And I know that's like, we see that all the time with Twitter. Like if someone's missing, mm-hmm. like my sister is missing, can you retweet this? Mm-hmm. Like that's, that makes it, yeah. And it, it works. Yeah. Sometimes. It does. And um, yet the proliferation of sensationalized stories also means that juries have preconceived notions about how crimes happen, how investigations unravel, and how justice is delivered. Mm. I can imagine that would, because you're not supposed to be biased or have like an opinion when you walk in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. Dude, finding 10 people who are not social media literate, Mm. that's not even your peers at a certain point. Yeah. It's all like old people. Have you heard of this case? I don't want old people judging whether or not I die. I know, yeah. Whether or not I'm fucking faced with the death penalty. That's insane. That is crazy. But it's, it's, I, I mean, 
it's a larger philosophical question of like, can anyone truly be objective? Mm -hmm. No. Because we're all influenced by our social environment. Yeah. And how we grew up and how we see the world. And so you can try. And I think that can be best accomplished through diversity Mm -hmm. on a panel. But at the same time, you know, we know how the American justice system works. And it's not always the case. Mm. Over the past decade, the number of nonfiction crime shows has dramatically increased because they're listening to the people. Yeah. Netflix has leaned into this genre with viral titles such as Tiger King, Making a Murderer, and Inventing Anna. That was about crime? Tiger King? Yeah. I thought it just like tigers. No. What was the crime? I never watched it. Oh, I, I, he, some, I mean, maybe there was like his, his tiger sanctuary was like unsafe there was a murder or something i don't know i know that there was a lesbian on that show who got like her hand bitten off and she was just like you know it happens every day and i'm like i want to meet you i want to find out what your issue is an eccentric larger than life unscrupulous character joe exotics management of the animals leads him into confrontation with animal welfare advocates and another zoo owner owner carol baskin i remember all this and I just never cared to watch it. Yeah. I was like, y'all are telling me about this <laughs> against my will. Bless. I did watch Making a Murderer, though. That's Wild. What's that about? I just keep licking this microphone. Why do I do it? Keep your tongue in your mouth. It's literally like, a, oh, oh, my God. I, I thought about it, and I just did it. Okay, you keep going. What? <laughs> Wait, what was it about? Making a Murderer was about that guy who uh, was allegedly innocent, but then, man, it's been so long. Why would you ask me that? Making and then inventing Anna. Anna is inventing Anna about. Uh, oh, oh my God! This is right. Making a murderer came out in 2015. Um, Steve Avery is freed from a wrongful conviction, so he served time for uh-huh. something he didn't do, and then ends up actually committing a crime later. Uh, so it was all about that journey of like what that does to the human brain. Yeah, crazy. Anyway. Things like this and the, the serial podcast, which launched in 2014, um, all inspired a boom, mm-hmm. basically. These were kind of the first to do it, and then it's just gotten crazy from there. The interest in news coverage of criminal trials is strong as well, especially when they're public figures. Uh-huh. One of the most notable modern true crime cases was OJ's trial in 1995, which was watched by over 150 million people. That is crazy. Fuck me. More recently, audiences followed the 2021 trial of Kyle Rittenhouse, the 17-year-old who shot three people during an anti-racism and police brutality protest in Wisconsin. I remember that all that. Very recent. Dude, he's on fucking TikTok. Him and his girlfriend are active on there. And I'm like, how are you even allowed to be alive right now? That is wild. Yeah. You're just allowed to just assimilate back into the world. Uh Uh-huh. And then the Depp versus Amber Heard trial, yes. The news stories are part of the larger trend of crime-related discourse with the audience of both news and and produced shows talking about the nuances of the court cases, discussing a judge's behavior, dissecting testimony and evidence, or wondering, is he guilty? This discourse adds to true crime's negative effects. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, that is so true. And you know what? Um, God, what movie was this? Or was it a documentary where, you know, when you serve jury duty yeah. and it's a criminal case like any of these, you're not allowed contact with the outside world because social media, like we said earlier, can sway your opinion. Yeah. More evidence is coming out that there some of these um, court, what am I trying to say? Jurors yeah. would see evidence on Twitter before they would in the actual courtroom. Oh, shit. It's just like, what the fuck are we doing? I know. And dude, oh, I mean, this is not jury, but it's a sentence. Uh, big Brother. <laughs> Like the celebrity Big Brother, there's like so. Ma- oh, there, what? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, but yeah, like it's like um, like they did the 2016 election. It's, you have no access to your phones, mm. and so like, oh, shit. so they all the people on Big Brother like they were like sitting down and they're like, so we have to tell you like who is elected the next president, and everyone is just like, are you fucking serious? It's Holy actually Donald shit, Trump. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Oh my god, people on Survivor. Just yeah. Like, what? What do you mean, Donald Trump? Oh, fuck, what was that? Oh, my gosh. Like, that lady, like, crossing the ocean, and they found... she Amelia Earhart. Oh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> this lady was, like, crossing the ocean in a boat, and her friends were like, she's going to be so pissed when she finds out about Roe v. Wade. Because, like, you can't fucking contact these people. Oh, my God. I know. That stresses me out. Yeah. If my phone ever, like, broke, yeah. or if something happened where, like, my... I, I don't know. I just could never have access to the internet again. Yeah. You just wouldn't know. Yeah, you How wouldn't. How do people stay tuned? I have the newspaper. 
Ugh. Yeah. There is a case against true crime. The storytelling element of this genre is a vital part of its appeal. It's why people turn on podcasts about serial killers during their morning commute, catch up on Netflix docuseries to wind down at night, or tune into the live courtroom feeds to keep up with the cases taking over social media timelines. That is so crazy that you unwind with, like, Richard Ramirez's like, killings. Just, like, I don't have words for it. That's like how... um. Like, if you, if you smoke a cigarette and you don't normally smoke cigarettes, it's going to give you, like, some form of adrenaline, right? Mm. Like, you're going to feel like... But if you smoke cigarettes long enough, you actually get, like, more depressed yeah, and, like, calm. lethargic. So, like, these people are so um, so addicted to the adrenaline that it actually calms them down now. I guess that's a very apt comparison. I think it's also um, th- the over-sensationalization of it. Mm-hmm. This no longer affects us the way that it should. Yeah. When you hear about, oh, so-and-so shot and killed 17 people in a movie theater, we're just like, again. Yeah. It doesn't have that heart-wrenching effect that it should because it's so... And I don't... I feel like you said this earlier of like, it's not that this is happening more. It's yeah. just that we know about it more. Mm-hmm. This has been happening for decades and decades in this country. And I'm sure there's been an uptick yeah. in, you know, whatever. But it's also like, we just hear about everything all the time, all at once. Yeah. So it desens- desensitizes us. Mm-hmm. Um, So publications such as Time and The Guardian have written about the exploitative nature of true crime media and how it affects families of victims who are often re-traumatized after being reminded of the murder. I, what I can't, what I would fuck me up so much is like if my friend who's a woman got killed and then someone's talking about it and I go in the fucking comment section and there's like comments like, what is she wearing? Or like that, (sighs) that would fucking like make me like ill you know yeah, what i mean yeah because i want to go through and be like what the fuck is wrong with you why does it matter yeah. and then there's now there's like multiple videos on it where like you know these, these shithead teenagers who are like trying to be edgy say something controversial i was like yep. this is a real person yeah you know or that- even like if it was your sister or yeah. your best friend and someone was like part one of the da 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 murder case yeah this is tea guys strap in yeah what is your problem dude these are real people and then you reach out to them and they're like i'm just trying to raise awareness i'm aware that she's dead and, you know and then at the end it's like I, and this is da 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 what do you guys think tell me in the comments yeah ah uh, we're like yeah, I'm, yeah. yeah I'm raising awareness for what yeah god um there's also like the csi effect um publications such as yeah um both nonfiction and fiction crime shows can influence people's understanding of how legal proceedings work. Um, this becomes an issue when those audiences become members of the jury. Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. Social media has added an- another layer of difficulty for those who work in criminal justice. Um, lawyers don't know how much jurors' perception of a case has been affected by what they've heard outside the courtroom. Yep. Uh-huh. And then that means lawyers must now prepare for trial based on what has been reported as well as the speculation has appeared on social media. So much to keep up with. Yeah. And all of that can affect you subconsciously, too. Like mm-hmm. if you heard someone talking about it on Twitter that and they have a theory that's plausible. You yeah. Know, you're going to bring that in with you to the courtroom. Yeah. It's wild. So on the flip side of the coin, in defense of true crime, Emily Danker Feldman Danker is such a... I love that name. Solid last name. I love when a last name has a hyphen in it, because it's like, you're not done. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Take up space. Yes, use a, you should. Use a colon. Start a list. You know? <laughs> Bullet points. Yes. Um, Emily Danker Feldman, the former director of the Innocence Clinic at the MU School of Law. This is a quote. One of the things that I talk to my students about is trying to craft a good narrative and a good story in their cases. Exposing them to good narratives, good storytelling in terms of various true crime docuseries or shows or films can help with that. When we talk about how to be good advocates in our cases, we have the state's story about what happened. It's often not the story that we believe is true. So how do we tell a different story that tells the narrative that we believe is true? That often means telling a story from the client's perspectives. Classic, just like how a court case works 101. Mm -hmm. The Equal Justice Initiative reports that racial discrimination often prevents black people and other people of color from serving on juries. EGI's Race in the Jury report reveals a study in which felony trial judges throughout North Carolina were 30% more likely to remove prospective jurors of color for cause than their white counterparts. At almost every step of the jury selection process, racial discrimination leads to predominantly white juries. That means the constitutional right to a jury of peers is not implemented when court practices prevent all voices from being included. Mm -hmm. True crime shows are a vehicle to get those voices into the conversation, even if it isn't directly in the courtroom. 
The prominence of different true crime stories encourages people to take cases to social media and advocate for those who otherwise wouldn't have advocates. This is what happened for defendant Adnan Syed following the Serial podcast. True crime media has become a viable option for commenting on the shortcomings of the legal system. Period. It's crazy that, like, we, I mean, we do worry that the jury is going to be biased, but it's even the people selecting the jury that are biased. Oh, everything is intentional as well. Yeah. That's, God, this fucking, everything about this. Um, what was I going to say also? Um, wait, wait, wait. Oh, yeah. So, um, they, you know, talk about crafting a good narrative and a good story in their cases. I also, like, it's a lot of, like, serial killers get, like, a nickname for that reason. Mm -hmm. Because, like, instead of, I mean, you could remember Richard Ramirez's name, but the Night Stalker, like, gets your attention. Yeah. And it gets people talking. He's doing what? (laughs) Stalking at night. Dang. Yeah, but, like, um... It's just it's just a way to like um, or BTK, you know, buying torture like that makes people interested. And so now there's more eyes on it and there's yeah. like more um, resources going to investigating it. Yeah. Yes. Which is good and bad. The But yes, um, there's also the verdict for consumers of true crime shows. Uh, moderation is important. Yes. According to Cleveland Clinic, a nonprofit multi special multi-speciality academic medical center watching too much crime can result in psychological effects such as increased fear anxiety and wariness yeah Yeah. which is not again an accurate version of reality yeah there is an acceptable amount of you know being aware of your surroundings and at the point that it limits you from being able to live a full life Uh because you're so overcome with anxiety and fear that you're gonna be murdered yeah it's just not realistic, uh-huh. you know, and, and and even statistics don't really help. Yeah. Because when there is violence against mm-hmm. women just for existing. So it's like and not just women. Obviously, mm-hmm. I'm just speaking because I am a woman. Yeah. But it's like I have a fear that has been instilled in me since I was probably five, six years old. Yeah. You know, just don't play outside. Don't do this. Don't do whatever. Mm-hmm. And that's why I'm so pale. Yes. Because <laughs> I wasn't allowed to play outside. At least you don't have wrinkles. Thank you so much. Uh-huh. But I am. Um, yeah, I mean, I think like it's the same thing with any sort of addiction where like you can drink in moderation. But if you're starting to get the shakes every morning and you yeah. have to remedy the anxiety with more alcohol like that's uh, or if you, you know, you're just you're making it worse. And then you also get like the physical symptoms of mm-hmm. anxiety. Like it's not anxiety is not just mental. Like if you're stressed out for long enough, like that could affect like your blood pressure, like yeah, your heart, your, your health condition. Yeah. And so like I can only imagine what that does to you physically. But um, true crime isn't inherently good or bad, but audience should recognize the difference between exploit, uh, exploitation and advocacy. Mm. Um, Which is TikTok. That's the thing. You're asking the general public to understand nuance. <laughs> <laughs> Mistake number one. We have been trying to do this for years. <laughs> <laughs> um, no matter how well a podcast, documentary, or a series is produced, it won't reflect the reality of a courtroom. Yeah. That is true. Like, I mean, we were talking about uh, one episode where lawyers watched, like, Movies where there's, uh, you know, a courtroom scene. Yeah, and they pick them apart. And they're like, this is technically correct, but it's like, you would, this would never happen in real life. Yeah. But then again, I mean, what are we talking about? Mm. These are, it's entertainment. Yeah. So great that it technically follows the r- rules of a, a trial. Mm-hmm. But like the actual occurrences, of course not, because it's dramatized. Yeah. Um, Such media can be a needed challenge uh, to a legal system that excludes marginalized people. Following Mm -hmm. the release of Netflix's When They See Us, many viewers reflected on the wrongdoings of the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. A former prosecutor and author was dropped from her publisher amid criticism of her role in convicting the exonerated five. In an NPR story, TV critic Eric Deegans talks about how effective the show was in highlighting the over-policing of people of color. And true crime can be an agent of change as long as audiences aren't accessories to its harmful effects. Which is a variable that is not predictable. Yeah. Because, I mean, with anything, like when you're trying to amass an audience that follows something and like, you know, awareness and action and change, there's always going to be those people that just misunderstand. Yeah. And like they think they're helping and they're just really undermining the movement. Oh, dude. It's always so crazy to see like someone who like someone who's a fan of you or like they get it. And then you see them speak on something else and you're like, oh, fuck. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like um, there was someone that followed me that called out someone for being transphobic. But then they called them a pig. And like that they were making fun of their weight. And I was like, oh, (sighs) you almost like you. No, no, no. Just missed it. Yeah. You just. Oh, it's another group of people that you're like, you know, I was like, you're 
transphobia wrong. Uh, the fatphobia wrong. But, yeah. So we gotta like dial it back. Yeah. And that's the problem that with these sort of audiences is that like they don't realize that there's like multiple issues. And it's just so much anger and they don't know where to direct it yes. properly. Yeah. That's it. So why are we obsessed with true crime, Brittany? Why are we obsessed with true crime? This is an opinion piece by Lawyer Monthly. I have Lawyer Weekly. <laughs> yes. You're more in the know than I yes. am. True crime dramas give us an insight into our culture and norms, as well as our anxieties and values. By watching true crime dramas, we unlock our natural desire to solve puzzles and mysteries. We didn't even talk about that. Uh-huh. I that, love puzzles. I do too. That's why I do Legos so much. Period. Yeah. It is that like... Just you want to know. Mm -hmm. And that's why also there is a big following of unsolved crimes. Yeah. Like BuzzFeed's Unsolved. All yeah. that. Like that was a huge thing a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And then people get upset when it's unsolved. It's yeah. like, yeah, well. Wait, I mean, this does make sense. Like, I mean, think about like if you were ever like cheated on and, you know, you didn't get the full story. Mm. And like, you know, a couple months later you find out one piece that you're like, holy fuck, like uh, just a series of events now makes sense. Right. You know, so it's, it's like the major version of that. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, and people get to speculate as to why criminals may act the way they do, which mm. is Silence of the Lambs, classic. Mm. These programs also allow us to examine the darker sides of humanity from a safe distance. And they bring in another crucial element, our natural desire for justice. Period. That's mm -hmm. a, These are all good. <laughs> Lawyer Monthly, you're <laughs> on to something, man. Y'all yes. should do this for a job. You guys should be professionals. People get emotionally invested and want to see those who have done wrong get caught and punished. Seeing this play out on screen can be hugely satisfying for viewers. Fear of crime and stereotyping mm -hmm. is another one why we're obsessed with true crime. A lack of knowledge of crime statistics combined with an overconsumption of certain types of media can create the perception that one is more likely to become a victim of crime than may be statistically true. In certain situations, fear of crime will influence people's behavior, and it has been shown that this fear can be disproportionate to a person's actual risk, which is what we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Although it is important to note that the risk of any one individual will vary greatly depending on multiple different factors. There can also be danger when it comes to stereotyping. When crimes perpetrated by or seen to be associated with a particular group in society are dramatized or overreported, it can give the impression that people form people from that group are disproportionately involved in crime and they can therefore be wrongly stereotyped as criminals. Yeah, like the fucking term black on black crime, it's not mm -hmm. real. It's the people who are committing these crimes live in an area where it's a large number of black people. Mm -hmm. So like it's would make sense that if it's against their neighbor and their neighbor is black, that would happen, you know? Yeah. Um, where it's like black on black crime doesn't exist. It's just people from a similar, like, neighborhood. No gay on gay crime. Yeah. I seek out homosexuals. Uh, no, I, I've never beaten up a gay person. Um, really? <laughs> but that can change. My birthday's in a couple weeks. <laughs> if anyone's looking to get beat around. Um, uh, what was, uh, yeah, so it's the, in certain situations, the fear of crime will influence. You know, so I have a fear. I know that this is not rational, that I will like get like fall off a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. I've like seen people have gotten their heads, like hit a bar, like took their head off. And I know that roller coasters, for the most part, are fairly safe. Yeah. The same with airplanes. But people are praying to a God they don't believe in right. if there's turbulence, yep. you know? Yep. Like you're like, <laughs> so I understand that it's so unlikely for me to die on a roller coaster, but I'm still like, I don't know about the Matterhorn. Yeah, the chances are yeah. improbable, but never zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get it. This uh, obsession with true crime as well is inspiring a new generation of law enforcement professionals, mm -hmm. which is good and bad because there are so many bad apples and it's a bad institution in general mm -hmm. but it's i understand you know this push to if you want to pursue law whether that's as a lawyer you know or as a, a an advocate in some sense of mm -hmm. just advantage disproportionately you know targeted people um and then if you want to go the police officer route or firefighter route or whatever i get that you want to make a change but you're entering into such a flawed mm -hmm. um industry and that's a larger discussion yeah. that, you know, it's, but it, it's interesting. While there is the possibility of fictionalized narratives setting unrealistic expectations and communicating misconceptions about roles in the criminal justice system and the police, there are also plenty of positive reasons why crime dramas could inspire the audience to take a wider interest in this field. And I think that that should be celebrated more mm -hmm. and they should be paid more. Yeah. Especially teachers. Yes. Because a lot of this goes back to... I was just talking about, I've got a whole family full of teachers and so much of the onus of whether you grow up to be a good or bad kid is dependent upon your 
your teachers. How if you're your parents, raised. Yes. Yeah. If your parents fail you, it, then the onus is now on your teacher. Yeah. And I, there are, that's what people love of a victory story, you know, yeah. of like, my football, my, my, my teacher, and yeah. da 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 inspired me to whatever. And it's like, they're life changing people when your parents fail you. So, mm -hmm. crazy. Trying to think about any teachers I really enjoyed when my parents were failing me. Um, what was your favorite subject in school? I liked English a lot, but mm -hmm. that's because I'm gay. Um, and I didn't know it. Yeah. Yeah. But I was the creative writing teacher's assistant for a while. Ah. I'd like proofread some papers. And the only thing that um, she was, I had to proofread them. And then also if some of them were alarming, I had to report them to the guidance counselor. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So like one would be like, you know, I'm blood ooze oozing from every orifice. And mm. I'd be like, hey, Tim. <laughs> Gotta go to the guidance counselor. Yeah, hey, <laughs> if you don't mind, we're yeah. just gonna sneak you yes. out of the room real quick. <laughs> we'll turn the lights off and you go out the back. <laughs> <laughs> There's also the rise of cozy crime. Wait, what's your favorite? What was your favorite like subject in school? Uh, Spanish. Oh yeah, in high school too. Yeah, dude, that's so cool. You can My, speak Spanish. Well, language teachers are always the fucking best. Like, because they're they're cultured, the right good ones. Okay. Um. I was fortunate enough to have really good Spanish teachers who mm -hmm. don't just teach you, you know, here's how to conjugate, come here. Yeah. But it's, and here's music. And yes. here's theater. Mm -hmm. And here's literature from all these cultures. Yeah. And here's how it varies country to country. And here's how this spread. And here's the history. When you learn all about that and you get to celebrate it. My Spanish teacher in high school, we used to have days where um, everyone had to make like a traditional Latin American dish. Yeah. And you brought it in. There was like flan and there was... Um, um, arroz y frijoles, and like everyone got to immerse themselves in the culture and celebrate it together. It was so fucking fun. That is cool. It's like that. If that was how all of my classes were, uh -huh. I would have had a great time. I would have loved math. <laughs> yes, but now I can't even add without my iPhone calculator. I, I mean, that is crazy. Like I, um, all of my history teachers were like guys that I like. PE teacher. I enjoy football coach. Yeah, like uh, the history teacher never chose to be a history teacher. It yeah. was always someone like. You know, the PE teacher, who's, he's got yep. some, like, a free period. Yeah, he just loved World War Two. Yeah, <laughs> I think I have a very, I understand, okay, I have a very soft spot for, like, teachers who lose their shit. Yeah. Like, you, they're just, just about to, like, always combust. And I know that, like, they probably shouldn't be teaching, but, like, I just get it, you know? Yeah, I definitely get it, too. Yeah. Some of my, my teachers were who were so unhinged. Yeah. And would just open the class being like, well, he left me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Like, I get it. <laughs> I get why you would open the class with that. Everyone needs to know. Like, you were talking about language teachers. I took French, and, like, mm -hmm. my French teacher, she just, when she, like, edited something or she, like, helped, she's just like, no, that's bad. Like, that <laughs> doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, thank you for not, like, it's just so fucking funny that you're yeah. not explaining anything. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. There's also the rise of cozy crime. <laughs> it's where you rob a Walmart in a onesie. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's not what it is. Um, when you slash someone in some Lululemon <laughs> leggings. Yes. Uh, there's Common Circle Theory W. Oh, this is what Stanley wrote. Common Circle Theory W. Um, a new generation discovers cozy crime. Cozy mystery is also referred to as cozies are a subgenre of crime fiction in which sex and violence occur off stage. The detective is the detective is an amateur sleuth, and the crime and detection take place in a small, socially intimate community. Wait, so what does it mean off stage? Um, <laughs> Cozy's oh, like like before the narrative starts. Oh, these okay. are these are this is fiction. Okay, okay. Cozy crime is fiction. Cozy is thus, dude. Sexual assault. Cozy. Um, cozy is thus stand in contrast to hard boiled fiction in which more violence and explicitly sexual explicit sexuality are central to the plot. The term cozy was first coined in the late twentieth century when various writers produced works in an attempt to recreate the golden age of detective fiction. Um, cozy crime has boomed in the last year, but there is still space for the psychological thriller, according to agents and editors who describe a general appetite for crime and escapism that has flourished under lockdown. But escapism, escaping into a worse world <laughs> where you've uh, like your home, like it sucks. God, I wish I was sexually assaulted at some point. Come on. <laughs> I wish my neighbor got murdered. Yeah, like that's interesting. Um, I think it's escapism more in the, the realm of it has nothing to do with you. Oh, okay. It's completely new characters, completely new players, completely new storyline. It has nothing to do with your real life. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, Teresa Keating, a senior editor at Viper, describes seeing a rise in cozy submissions dating back to before the pandemic, stressing that it has been thriving, a thriving subgenre in the digital market in particular for a while. Um, like others who spoke to the bookseller, she thinks the recent uptick is down to a recent taste for escapism fueled by the current events. Yeah. The th uh, so, your. You're like, God, I 
I'm escaping it where someone else's life is horrific. And right. that's comforting. Yeah. I would, but I mean, I don't, I, and let, I don't really like find any comfort in like, yeah, someone, you know, grandma got killed. At least I'm not them, you know, like yeah. it seems kind of, I mean, maybe I'm not getting it as much as well, I. Well, I mean, it's like anything. Why do we watch a movie, a thrilling movie? Why do we read a thrilling book? Why do we, you know, it's like, yeah. it's entertainment as well mm -hmm. as, as much as it is escapism. Okay. People are flocking to cozy crime books because of the oversaturation of graphic violence inside the mainstream true crime, as well as a way of escapism from our current times. Times are tough, and using cozy crime as an escape compared to other violent genres of true crime makes sense as a current rising trend. Um, and I would like to see Nancy Drew as a cozy crime. Oh, interesting. Harry Potter? <laughs> Imagine like, dude, how many ch ch like children and teachers have been killed at that school? Oh, dude, oh, that, you got a good point. Yeah, so much death at Hogwarts. Like, I imagine like you know, Cedric Diggory died in front of the entire student Holy body. Shit. The next book should just be about the students going to therapy. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, and the trial. I read that. <laughs> the trials and tribulations of PTSD. Exactly. Not Voldemort. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, dude, cozy crime. This is like a mental crime. The the idea behind what's that Rapunzel that she should be deeply disturbed. Oh, yeah. Like there's if you are isolated from the world, there are people who have been trapped in closets for like years and they are out of their mind. Harry Potter. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Gay people. Um, <laughs> no. Okay. no, but so like it's like I what I don't understand why no one's talking about as much is Rapunzel should be so fucked up. Oh, it's her shielded from the world. Only ever talked to her mom. She's never seen a man in yeah. her life. Talks to an iguana. And then the man shapes her worldview. Yeah. So toxic. She's basically like literally a child. I know she may be yeah. like 17, but like mentally she should be a fucking four year old. Should have no speech capacity. Yeah. Because who's talking to her? I know. It's just her mom. And like there's no way that she's reading all those books. Like you no. have to have like a very high intelligence like level. Yeah. I mean, I also know that most of the Disney works are like based off like horrific German fairy tales. Oh, dude. Yeah. I would love to do an episode on that. Dude, okay, but then, oh, so we think about, like, the spectacle of crime, like, as it is right now. Like, it's kind of offensive. People used to get, like, hung for entertainment. Yeah. You know, like, you're, just imagine being so bored in your hut that, like, they're, like, they're going to hang a bunch of murderers. And you're just like, oh, that's fine. They tortured people for entertainment. Yeah. Like, st shove stuff off their butt. Yeah. And people were like, this is funny. I was like, imagine seeing that today. Even if it was, like, someone who killed my sister. I wouldn't want to watch a spike go up their ass. Yeah. Yeah. What a what a um, barbaric time. I know. And, and th this is also happening concurrently at the time of like colonialism and like imperialism where yeah. people are like, we're the civilized society. Uh -huh. Let's go settle other places. <laughs> it's like, that's the most barbaric fucking primal bullshit I've ever heard. I can't even imagine if I'm astounded by what my mother spews out of her mouth <laughs> and she was born in the 50s. Can you imagine someone born in the 1700s? They are probably, it's not even the fact that they're speaking old English. It's the fact that, oh my God, you have like so many mental illnesses happening at once. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand how anyone had a loving childhood. Oh, well, they didn't. <laughs> yes. And they also couldn't read and they smelled like horse shit. Yes. So. And they pissed in the street. God, I miss it. God. God, take me back. Am I right? <laughs> yes, I wish. But um, so this has been our episode of about true crime. Yeah, I hope that was kind of, I mean, it's not all encompassing, but I feel like it. we really... Mm -hmm. umbrella covered the internet's obsession with true crime and yeah. kind of when it started so hope you guys enjoyed we love y'all so much and, mm -hmm. and uh, um, if y'all want to check us out on YouTube we have a video version of this if we you're do. listening only on audio so like and subscribe and listen to us on Spotify Apple Podcasts any place you get your podcasts you uh uh what's it called what Google Podcasts. Google Podcasts. Does anyone use Google Podcasts? I think there's like seven of them. Good for y'all. <laughs> y'all keeping Google <laughs> yes. alive. All uh, right. We love you guys. Follow us on everything, I guess. And uh, please don't make TikToks about current true crime events. And if I get killed, please don't sensationalize it. If you get killed, do I have permission to make a TikTok about it? Um, only if I died on a roller coaster. Okay. All right. Thank you guys so much for watching and listening. Peace. Or just listening. All right. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs>